in this episode of The Reef with Gabriel and Tong, hot on their trail, Kai and the intergalactically wanted criminal known as Ghoulie seek refuge in the town of Kick My Nuts. But while most frontier towns on the reef are lawless and wild, Kick My Nuts has lawmen, and they know how to deal with lawbreakers like Kai and Ghoulie. Will our heroes swing from the noose? Find out next on The Reef, episode number seven. Welcome to the serialized audiobook, The Reef, written by Scott Sigler and Matt Wallace. Narrated by Scott Sigler. Hello, junkies. This is episode number seven, which means we are halfway through this violent venture. If you don't want to wait another seven weeks to hear the rest of the story, go to Audible, snag the reef. It's there. It's also over at iTunes in its entirety. No waiting. You can get the whole story right now. Some nasty, nasty stuff goes down in this episode. So let's get into it. Here we go with The Reef, episode number seven. Chapter 10. The Bounty Turned out that Ghoulie's ability to fly provided an advantage Kai hadn't considered at first. The hurrah could go up high and keep a lookout for any potential threats. That let Kai ride his Krellmont much faster. They made Kick My Nuts in two days instead of three. Kiri Harik, a quith word meaning, we survived this, made Break My Back look like the ramshackle anarchist pig pen it was. The dome was three times the size of Break My Backs, and there was a second, smaller dome close by. A glowing holo sign on the smaller dome side read, Home of the Reef Stompers, with a Dinolition League logo right below it. A proper sports arena. It put the home of Triumph Trial to shame. Once inside the city dome, Kai was surprised to see buildings that were well-constructed, streets that were clean and cobbled. There was little branch of any color, no shimmer scale at all. There were plenty of humans on the streets, a few key in Sklorno as well. A handful of hurrah and Kretorakians flew through the air. All of those species combined, however, were still a visible minority. This was a quith town. Workers everywhere, hustling to and fro as they always seemed to do. Thick warriors and little leaders abounded. It was good odds this town had more than a few excellent gin joints. Such a difference between a human expat town and a quith one. Working streetlights, glowing store signs, and, believe it or not, functioning public holo tanks. Those holo tanks made two things very clear. First, there was an active transport system to take sentience off world. Second, there was a cost to having this kind of order on the reef posted laws and the punishments for breaking them. Punishments that, more often than not, included death. No pesky trial necessary. Nice place, Ghoulie said. Maybe not for a lawbreaker like you. I'm as clean as they come. Ghoulie said, with what Kyle imagined was supposed to be mock innocence. Right. Just watch yourself. They made their way to the center of town to take it all in. Ghoulie used a public holo tank to identify a flight that would carry him off-world. These in two hours, Ghoulie said. Next transport after this one? Three days from now. Kai looked at the price of the flight. It cost more than some of the purses he'd won for professional fights. How the hell are you going to pay for that? I haven't paid for anything in decades, Ghoulie said. There isn't a ship made that I can't sneak onto. I'm an intergalactically known... For high one's sake, give it a rest, will ya? Ghoulie had made his choice. He was leaving. Kai wondered why that bothered him. He'd known the hurrah for all of a few days, and it wasn't like Ghoulie had said he intended to stay. Well, Kyle said, I guess this is it. You know, you don't have to thank me for patching up your suit and saving your life. And you don't have to thank me for springing you from that cozy little case. I want to said something about that. Eventually. Right, Kai said. Two sentients from different species, but both with the same innate difficulty in saying thank you. 
Guli made a sound neither his voice box nor Kyle could decipher, then flitted away. Kyle watched Guli go. He was almost sad. It surprised him that he'd actually enjoyed the Hurrah's company over the past two days. Guli was funny. Humor was a lost art form in most places on the reef. In those two days, Kai had gotten a sense of the Hurrah. While intergalactically known assassin was probably far too grandiose, it was clear Guli wasn't some innocent soul. The Hurrah was hard inside. Well, as hard as a gas-filled hollow chamber could be, anyway. During his time in Break My Back, Kai had heard about the no-bullshit laws of Kick My Nuts. So he'd avoided the place. It seemed logical. He was, after all, a fugitive from both a powerful religion and from one of the most dangerous criminals in the galaxy. Any attention from real cops, cops who might actually check biometric information, was bad news. When Kai saw the Joromar bathhouse in the town's main boulevard, he realized how foolish he'd been to avoid Kick My Nuts. The Quith had designed the place, and while it did offer freshwater showers, the house specialty was chemical baths. Kai had learned of this luxury during his fighting days, later in his career when he'd been flush with money. Strong acid evaporated to create a gas cloud that peeled microscopically thin layers from the bather's skin. It was rumored to be the deepest clean in the galaxy. After the past few weeks, Kyle felt as though that's exactly what he needed. He paid for their top-shelf peel job and entered a private, second-floor spa chamber, marveling at how much the space resembled something you'd find in a five-star hotel in the Quith Concordia. Chemical tank, oversized spa bed, some strange, decorative purple plants that thrived on the acid clouds. Renard's money spent very well indeed. Kai stripped down. He put on provided goggles to protect his eyes. He chewed a catalyst tablet. The material in the tablet coated his teeth. It would neutralize the evaporated acid before it entered his lungs. A few lungfuls of the stuff wouldn't really hurt. He'd tried it in his younger days just to see what would happen, but he didn't really need three days of an irritating cough. He stepped to the room's big, 200-liter ceramic acid tank, looked at the control panel. It offered anything from a mild scrape to a deep cleanse that would make his skin red and tender for days. He'd never been that good at moderation. He cranked the controls to full. He felt so unclean, and it wasn't just from the day's long journey here. The beating Kai had given Renard, a man who had done nothing to him, a man who wasn't a skilled fighter, a man who had already fought that night, so couldn't possibly be at his best. Kai might as well have beaten up a child or kicked a puppy. Unclean indeed. Kai needed a drink. He needed one bad. No, not this time. Maybe it was time to stop. Maybe. Or, maybe it was time for maybe to become absolutely. At the very least, he could hold off on that drink until after his bath. Kai lay face down on the spa bed. The chemical mist grew thicker, ate away at the layers of filth he'd accumulated on the road. It stung a little, like that feeling when you first realize your skin is getting sunburnt. Pain, even mild pain, the key to his focus. Heavenly. He felt the tension drain away, felt his muscles ease. Money well spent. This was exactly what he needed. It was then that Kyle, the heretic North, made a mistake. He allowed himself to relax. So relaxed that he fell asleep, with no one there to watch his back. He awoke when an iron-hard arm circled around his neck, another around his abdomen. The effect was nearly paralyzing. In that first instant, Kai recognized a foe that, unlike poor Renard, really knew how to grapple, how to disable a human body with minimal effort. It was only Kai's lifetime of training that let him react at all. Face down, he had few options and only moments before he passed out. Fortunately for him, he'd been in the same position more times than he could possibly remember. 
Kai lurched to his right hip, knees pointed left, throwing the weight on him off just a bit to the right, just enough for him to lock his left hand into a rigid tiger claw. There wasn't time for anything other than to go for where his attacker's eyes would be, to drive his thumb into that soft space before blackness took him down. He struck, reaching behind his head. His fingertips jabbed into his attacker's face. Then, like a blind spider hunting for food, Kai's hand adjusted. His thumb landed on the man's eye, only to find it blocked by goggles. Before Kai could knock the goggles away, the hand of a second attacker locked down on his wrist, shoved that wrist down to the spa bed. Kai was just starting to black out when he heard the wisp of a steel blade slipping from a cloth scabbard. His next sensory experience was the intense pain of that same blade plunging through the back of his left hand, driving through the meat of his palm and impaling the bed beneath. I won't ask if you remember us, the knife man said. We're not easy to forget. Give him a little air, Tong. The python grip around Kai's throat relaxed just enough for him to draw a shallow breath. The knife slid free of his hand. Still seeing spots of black, Kai could scarcely believe it as he was hefted up like nothing and slammed upright against the chemical tank. He had to strike, or he was lost. Kai brought a knee up, kicking blindly, felt it glance off a thick body. His left armpit exploded with agony, his mind reeling with both anger and instant respect. His arm hung limp, immobilized by the best nerve cluster strike he had ever suffered. This Tong was a better fighter than almost everyone Kai had faced in the octagon. In the split-second disorientation after the nerve strike, Tong had Kai's right hand twisted around, pointer finger agonizingly bent backward, locked in that disturbingly strong grip. His back flat against the tank, Kai stood as still as he could. He had to play it calm, look for a way out of this. The two men from the dunes, both wearing goggles. I am Gabriel, the knife man said. My associate here, Tong, is just waiting for a reason to rip your finger clean off. No shit, Kai said, growling out the words. Seeing as I'm naked, I thought he was rubbing me down for a little foreplay. Gabriel smiled. He unsheathed the second blade, one much longer, then stepped closer. You beat up Bernard and took money that didn't belong to you, Gabriel said. Valenti sent us to bring back your head, but he wanted us to put you through the ringer first. Lacerations, contusions, fractures, that sort of thing. He told us to take our time. But I will make you a deal, big man. Tell me where the hurrah went, and I'll take your melon off with one clean cut. Stall me, waste my time, and I'll start at your ankles and work my way up to your neck. Kai tried moving his left arm. No go. The thing hung from his shoulder like a big dead fish. He flexed his right arm just a little, had to bite back the pain that came when Tong applied more pressure. Kai wondered if his finger was already broken. He could endure that pain. He'd endured far, far worse. He could even let Tong snap his finger right off if doing so provided a tactical advantage. But with one arm incapacitated against two foes, one who knew how to brawl and one armed with blades, there was no tactical advantage to be had. It was a rare situation, one Kai couldn't hit his way out of. At least, he couldn't hit them. He let his head drop, chin to chest. A fist smashed against his cheek. Kai didn't have to open his eyes to see who'd thrown it. A good punch, but from the relatively light impact, Kai knew it was Gabriel, not Tong. No, you don't, Gabriel said. You don't pass out on me. Kai lifted his head slightly, squinted at the man. If you don't want me to pass out, do you really think hitting me in the face is logical? Gabriel hit him again, this time a straight shot to the right eye. Kai felt the eye start to swell almost instantly. Next smart-ass comment, I get to slicing, Gabriel said. Where is Ghoulie? 
Kai let his head drop again, but lifted it just as fast. He took a breath, repeated the motion. What is this? Gabriel said. You stroking out of me, big boy? No, I'm good, Kai said. Just getting ready. Gabriel laughed. For what? For your own torture and eventual mutilating death? Not exactly. Kai dipped his head one more time, focused all of his energy, all of his will. He was out of options. He had one chance and no idea if it would work. Hell, it might even hurt him worse than Tong had. Kyle North threw his head backward with everything he had. The back of his head smashed into the ceramic tank. An instant of blackness, like a foot stamping down on his brain, but through that void he heard the crack. A spray of undiluted, pressurized acid spewed forth like a mini geyser. Gabriel screamed, jumped away. Tong grunted, his grip loosened, and in that moment, Kai threw his forehead straight into the big man's face. Something broke. Kai's skull or Tong's nose, Kai didn't know. The room became a thick cloud of undiluted acid mist, so dense you couldn't see two meters in front of you. Kai dropped to the floor and rolled immediately to his left. The blows to his head were bad enough, even without the skin on the back of his head bubbling and sizzling, his hair instantly melting, his scalp sending him a message that said, even you can only take so much. The stink of burned hair and burned flesh. His forehead was burning almost as bad as the back of his head. He rolled to his feet. Tong was down, his face, shoulders, and chest hissing and smoking, his skin bubbling. The headbutt had smeared some of the acid covering Tong's face onto Kai's forehead. And, yeah, that headbutt had also broken Tong's nose. The man's mouth opened and closed, as if he wanted to scream but didn't know how. Tong slowly rolled to his hands and knees. And that's when the tank cracked down the middle. Kai reacted, stepping aside, getting clear. Tong didn't. 200 liters of acid coursed across the floor and splashed over Tong. If the man hadn't known how to scream before, he knew now. He rolled, acid covering him, melting his skin, his clothes, acid so strong it started to eat through the floor. Kai moved away from the slowly expanding puddle, searching through the chemical fog for the other foe. He saw Gabriel moving toward him. The knife man's face smoked and bubbled, as if someone had drunkenly brushed streaks of boiling oil on it. Half his upper lip was dripping away like a dangling piece of sizzling bacon. Gabriel was hurt, but behind his goggles, both eyes were wide and clear. And there was nothing wrong with his legs, his arms, or his hands, including the hand that still held that long blade. Kai was in no condition to engage in a standing fight with anyone, let alone a professional killer. Left arm still numb, left hand still bleeding, the back of his head bubbling so bad Kai could hear it sizzle, he readied himself for one mad berserker charge. Three massive strides carried him across the room, closed the gap between himself and Gabriel. Kai drove a push kick into Gabriel's chest, sent the man flying across the room. The knife spun away. Gabriel landed hard on the floor, tailbone first, rolled backward and smacked into the wall. Kai started to go after him, to finish it, but a wave of pain gripped his body, seemed to knock his legs out from under him. He fell to his knees, saw the blood pouring from his outer right thigh. Before the knife had been knocked free, it had slashed Kai's leg. But this battle wasn't over. Gabriel wasn't out. The man put his back against the wall, pushed himself standing on wobbly legs. He flicked his left arm. The smaller of the two knives appeared in his hand. It had been a long time since Kai had felt this weak. A long time since that desperate bout against Korak, the cutter. Kai pushed himself up. He stood, jammed his right hand against the cut on his right leg, ordered his left arm to move. His left arm refused. 
Gabriel's eyes flick from Kyal to Tong's inert, scorched form. The sizzling bear of a man had stopped moving. There was no sympathy or anger in Gabriel's eyes, only a bland, almost casual acceptance. The goggled eyes turned back to Kai. I'm going to cut you, Gabriel said. I am going to slice you into pieces. He took a step forward. Kai raised his right hand into the best fighting position he could muster. He took a step to improve his stance and slipped on his own blood, fell hard to the side. Don't care about Valenti anymore, Gabriel said. Don't care about the money. Don't care about Ghoulie. He stepped closer. Kai tried to rise. He simply could not. A new voice, a tinny, metallic one. Gooly still cares about you. Gabriel looked toward the door just as a flying blur of gray smacked into him, knocked him off his feet. Gooly turned sharply, wings undulating through the smoke-filled air. He dove for another strike, but Gabriel's boot heel shot up, smashed into the hurrah's wide mouth. Gooly tumbled across the room. Where Gabriel got his energy from, Kai would have liked to know. The man was up in an instant, smaller knife still in his hand. Kai tried to rise again, and again, he failed. Gabriel strode toward him. And that was when Kai heard the sound of something snapping. The floor gave way. Limp, spent, beat to hell, and not really giving a crap anymore, Kai just fell. He was out for a few seconds, maybe a few minutes. He didn't know. When he came to, he was lying in a twisted heap of sizzling, smoking rubble. He tried to look around. He could only see out of his left eye. The right was already swollen shut. His goggles were gone. His eyes burned. The huge spa bed had crashed near him. A meter closer, the bed he'd treated himself to would have crushed his skull. Gooly! Kai called out to the hurrah. The hurrah's mechanical voice called back. Still alive, Cooley said. <laughs> For another minute, maybe. A shadow fell over Kai. Gabriel, the knife. Kai thought about trying to fight, but he was as done as done gets. I guess you win, he said. You're under arrest. Kai blinked, squinted up. It wasn't Gabriel. It was a quith warrior. A quith warrior that slapped handcuffs on Kai's wrists. Chapter 11. The Cell Bat's root cellar was a palace by comparison. Kyle assumed his cell had been built for a quith worker. Workers were, on average, less than half his size. But even a quith worker would have been cramped in this stone cubbyhole where Kai had been stuffed after his arrest. Cell bars too thick to bend. Damp stone corridor beyond them. Cell ceiling too low for him to stand, to even kneel. Walls so close he couldn't even stretch out while lying flat. He lay there, in a fetal position, knees to his chest. Hands shackled at the wrists. And he was still naked. Cold, hard floor against cold, raw skin. Good times. The big warrior cop had hauled him away from the bathhouse. Kai's ears had rung with the cries of the wounded who had been on the floor below. Those cries had been shut out when the cop had thrown Kai in the back of a vehicle. He hadn't been aware enough to see what kind. All he knew was that when the door shut, the cries of the wounded were far quieter. Maybe it had been an ambulance. He had nanosite bandages around his head, thigh, and left hand, yet didn't remember when those had been put on him. He'd been in the cell for a day, maybe. No one had come to talk to him, either to interrogate him or to hand down a sentence. He wasn't sure if he'd get a trial. Would they kill him here, or take him to the center of town, hang him right and proper, frontier style? He hadn't had anything to eat or drink. There were no mats in the cell, no running water. Thirsty as hell, but the lack of water helped with another issue. 
the sallow, stinking hole in the middle of the floor, into which Kyle was trying very hard not to stare and trying harder not to use. He saw no guards walk past. As far as he could tell, he was alone on the cell block. Cramped, no food, no water, very little light. A delightful place. Ghoulie, you out there? Kai had called out the same thing every hour or so, as near as he could guess. No answer the times before, no answer this time. Either they'd sequestered the hurrah somewhere else, taken his voice box away, or... Kai found it bothered him intensely to think about the implications of that or. Ghoulie had saved his life. Twice. If the little sneak hadn't come back and attacked Gabriel, Kai would be dead. And to do so, Ghoulie had missed his transport off the reef. He'd be stuck here at least three more days. Why? Had the Haras spotted Gabriel and Tong, maybe followed them? Or had Ghoulie followed Kai, knowing those thugs were still out for blood? Either way, there was no gain for Ghoulie. No profit. No money at all. Ghoulie could have just left. Instead, he'd put himself in serious danger. And had done so to protect Kai. Too bad Ghoulie's sacrifice was wasted. In a place like Kick My Nuts, they kept the peace by killing anyone who broke it. Self-defense? Kai didn't think that would float. He'd killed one man. The collapsing floor had injured others. If any of those people had died, well, then he was done for. The more he thought about it, the more he came to peace with the obvious. When they finally led him from this tiny cell, he would be executed. After everything he'd been through, after already dying once and coming back, after escaping the purest nation and one of the most ruthless gangsters in known space, the story of Kyle North would finally reach its end. Perhaps, at least, they'd offer him honorable combat. Even against impossible odds, which is exactly what Kai would expect, it was preferable to any execution. Maybe he'd reveal to them who he really was. Former heavyweight champion of the galaxy. Killer of Korak the Cutter, a hero to the quith. Yes, that information might make more than a few warriors ask for combat. Every enameled and etched carapace in town would want to crack at the heretic. A nice dream. Reality? The reality was that he'd probably swing from a noose. Ghoulie, you out there? No answer. Kai closed his eyes. In minutes, he was asleep, dreaming of dying in hand-to-hand combat, in a blaze of glory worthy of song. Something tickled his nose. Kyle brought up both shackled hands, brushed at it without opening his eyes, then started to drift back to sleep. Again, that soft, feathery sensation around his nostrils. Insect of some kind. Had to be. He covered his face with his hands. This time, whatever it was tickled his elbow. It was then Kyle remembered he was in a cell, and that there existed no circumstance under which being tickled in his sleep might be a good thing. He snapped awake. He stared through the dim light at a silhouette squatted down just outside his cell bars. Wakey, wakey, said a lilting feminine voice. Hands off, snaky. If you're room service, I'm a little short on cash, but promise you my undying loyalty and gratitude. Yeah, I figured you could use a nibble and some hydro right about now. She tossed a piece of fragrant bread through the bars. He picked it up, still hot. He devoured it like a key who had skipped lunch. She then slid a tin cup of fresh water past the bars. Kyle accepted it, washed the bread down. Thank you, he said, and meant it. I don't suppose the grub comes with yard time. You wouldn't believe the stinger I've got going to my lower back. His back did hurt, although it was nothing compared to the pain of his scalp. Turned out, acid burns hurt. Who would have guessed it? 
Sorry, tough guy. The woman sounded like she meant it. It's going to be a little while longer. Why hold me this long? Less holding and more hazing, actually. Kyle didn't know what that meant, and he didn't care to decipher it. I, uh, suppose it doesn't make any difference if it was self-defense. Not a bit. Then let's get this over with. You're that eager to die? She sounded genuinely curious. I'll take hanging over being stuck in a hole, living the shadow of that same death. Yeah. No fear in you? He didn't answer her. A moment later, she touched something he couldn't see outside the cell. Lights came on, both inside and out. Kai found himself staring at a truly gorgeous woman, perhaps mid to late thirties. She was on her heels, angling her head to be able to look into the cell. He saw only the left side of her face. Blonde hair, the shade and shape of stalactites almost reached her shoulders. A simple, form-fitted black utility suit. Kyle caught the outline of a spitter hung low beneath the curve of her hip. My name is Panama, she said. Pam, if you like. Call me Pammy, though, and I'll put one behind your ear. I wouldn't dream of it. I may stick with Sir, in fact. Panama's mouth seemed to want to laugh, but no laughter came. There was something odd about her. Something off. So, Pam, what's a lovely creature like you doing in a dank rat hole like this? She turned to face Kai full on. The left side of her face was indeed lovely. The right side of her face, however, was non-existent. Only a few thin strands of flesh remained, stretched tight across what looked like a steel skeleton. Kyle saw hints of servos in other moving parts. Her right eye looked real. It matched her left, at least. Her hair looked the same on both sides. Kyle, who'd been face to maw with drooling satanic monsters intent on either devouring him or ripping his head off to prove a point, wasn't repelled. To the contrary, he was fascinated. He scooted closer to the bars. Something in his expression or his body language must have put her at ease. His scrutiny didn't make her uncomfortable, didn't make her withdraw. What do you think? she asked him. I think you're more beautiful than you were five seconds ago. Oh, my. Kyle detected a slight note of embarrassment. With game that sharp, you must absolutely swim in genitalia. Gender and species as you prefer, of course. Despite his situation, Kyle laughed, loudly, genuinely, and for several long, uninterrupted seconds. I think the word you want is swam, he said. I don't buy into the whole 72 virgins waiting for me at the end of the noose. Speaking of which, are we going to get on with this hanging, or what? All I can tell you is some mighty big and mighty strange talk is going on upstairs, and it all concerns you. I haven't a clue what that means. It means hang in there, Charmer, Panama said. She stood. She lingered for a moment in front of his cell. He could only see her black boots. She walked away, once again leaving him with only a view of the stone corridor. Kyle craned and strained against the bars to watch her go. Thanks for the eats, he called after her. Thanks for checking out my ass just then, she called back. For the second time, Kyle laughed. That is it for episode number seven of The Reef. Mr. Tong got what was coming to him. I think it did not go well. Next week, will Kai get what is coming to him? And will Ghoulie, the intergalactically wanted criminal, will he get what is coming to him? Find out next week on episode number eight. And until then, we will talk to you all real soon. You have been listening to The Reef. A Galactic Football League novella. Written by Scott Sigler and Matt Wallace. Narrated by Scott Sigler. Audiobook directed by A.B. Kovacs. And engineered by Steve Rickyberg. 
Copyright 2019 by Empty Set Entertainment. All rights reserved. Theme music is by the band Amps and Volts.